Welcome, Whiskey Theologians. This is Around the Word in Many Glasses. Today, we'll be revisiting uh, Cooper's Craft Barrel Reserve, and we'll be looking at the Old Testament reading from last Sunday uh, from the book of Jonah. So sit back, relax, pour yourself a drink, and let's get into it. So, this is the first time on the channel that I'm going back to something I've already had uh, on the channel. And there are a couple of reasons why I'm doing this. The first is that I've found that especially stuff I've not had before, or I haven't had in a long time, um, I don't know what it is, it's the camera and that I'm trying to say things with it, I don't taste anything, um, which is not true. Um, I miss a lot as I'm tasting and going through it. It's not until um, I'm finishing, because I rarely finish these uh, glasses during the episode. It's not until I'm finishing the glasses after, while I'm rendering and all that good stuff, that I realize just how much flavor, I suppose, is there that I'm just not getting um, as I go through this. So I remembered a few things from the last episode when I was finishing off uh, the Cooper's Craft, and... Um, I'm excited to get going again. The other reason, and definitely the main reason that we're revisiting the Cooper's Craft and we will be revisiting whiskeys in the future, is that I do not have unlimited funds. <laughs> and so, we're going to be going over whiskeys a lot, because um, I'm not going to buy a whiskey to do this much on the show and then uh, continue on. Additionally, I don't drink that much, and so... Honestly, almost all of the drinking I've been doing since I've started this channel has been on this show. I'm doing almost nothing outside of it, um, which I think is a good thing. Um, I, you know, maybe it's uh, a way at moderate temperance, right? I find myself saying, "Oh no, I'm not going to have a drink you know, in the afternoon or with dinner because I'm going to have one when I film an episode tonight." So who knows? Uh, unintended consequence of that. So, cheers as I revisit. Cooper's Craft. I'm liking this more the more I drink it. In fact, the reason this is the one I'm drinking today is because I looked at the shelf and that one looks good. And I grabbed it, right? There's no deep meaning behind that. Oh, that would be interesting if I could find a reason. Uh, but I don't have. Um, one thing that I think I may have messed up on the last episode is I think I started calling this Cooper's Craft Barrel Select. This is Barrel Reserve. I don't think they have a Barrel Select. I don't know. But this one is Barrel Reserve. I got it right in the title. Um, in fact, it was when I was writing the title that I thought to myself, I may have said the wrong thing. If I were to describe this whiskey in one word, it would be caramel. Or caramel. I don't know which way you're supposed to. Either way, I say caramel most of the time, I assume. It's caramel. And it's a, it's a caramel that changes over time. It's really interesting. Um, so it starts out really sweet. Sweeter than I was expecting. Um, and sweeter than I realized the first time I, I tried it on the channel. It starts out with a, a sweet caramel note. And then as, it, as you go through it and you... Uh, it goes through the different parts of your palate. I don't know how much about how palating stuff works. But uh, and as you begin to swallow it, then you get kind of a wood fire caramel, like a charred caramel almost. Um, I don't know. That's just the best way I can think to describe it. And then as you breathe out on the finish, it's almost like um, a vanilla caramel. There's definitely a vanilla, or at least what I think is a vanilla note, um, coming out um, with it. It's... Like I said, I think it's caramel all the way through, uh, but it changes, which is really interesting how uh, how that happens. I don't, I can't think of a time I've had another whiskey that does that. I've definitely had whiskeys that have changed over the course of you know the the sip, but not with the same kind of flavor coming through and morphing as you drink it. It's it's really uh, I keep saying interesting. I'm, I'm like I said, it's uh, it's one I'm going back to specifically because I wanted to. Try it again. So this is uh, today, um, our, what am I calling this? Monday Meditations. 
where I look at the previous um, Sunday's lectionary readings and kind of talk about them. Talk about either a text that I didn't preach on because either I wasn't preaching or I chose a different text um, for that Sunday. Or kind of to take the what I did preach on in a different direction. Maybe a thought I had at some point that I, for one reason or another, decided not to go with. Um, this one's going to be a little bit different. I'm actually filming this a week in advance. So the previous Monday meditation came out this afternoon uh, of filming. And there's a very particular reason why I'm doing this. Um, I am preaching this coming Sunday. And I looked through the text. And nothing happened. <laughs> Usually I will read through the text and something. I get some sort of a direction or a vague idea in my mind. Nothing. Well, that's not true. I had one, I think, really creative idea with the gospel reading. Um, but I think this is one of those cases where creative doesn't mean good. Um, I think it would have been really interesting. Uh, it would have been a fun sermon to preach, possibly. But... I don't think I don't think it would have been efficacious, uh, particularly to the congregation, to the people. So I don't think I'm going to end up doing that. Um, of course, if all else fails, I might. <laughs> um, so if I preach a really creative sermon, or if I did preach yesterday, um, six days in advance for me, um, but it would be yesterday for all of my members who are watching. If I preached a really creative sermon on the gospel text, then I decided to go with it anyway. And who knows if that was a good idea? I, you can let me know. Um, but I read the text and essentially nothing. And so uh, I grabbed some commentaries off my shelf. Um, a commentary I really, really like, especially for this sort of uh, sending me off in a direction, is uh, it's the Ancient Christian Commentary on the Scripture. Um, it's a massive set. I don't have the whole thing. And it takes the church fathers from about the first 500 years a little bit of extension beyond that. And it compiles a number, not all, but a good amount of thoughts on just about every verse of the Bible. Certainly every verse in the New Testament. Uh, Old Testament has some bigger spaces. It's a really awesome commentary. It's definitely on the academic professional level. Um, it's not like it's confusing, but it, it gets pretty technical. Sometimes you have to take certain things guys are saying with a grain of salt because, well... They were speaking 1,700 years ago, um, and sometimes they're just talking about something completely different, or they go off into allegory land, and sometimes that's great, but sometimes it's not. Um, so I did that. I grabbed the, I only had one of the commentaries, it was the gospel again. So I got, I grabbed my ancient Christian commentary on Mark off the shelf, and I read through the whole section, which I tend not to even do. I usually just read through the overview, and that's usually enough to get me in a get me off and go into the races, but nothing, not even, yeah, it was completely no help at, at all, and so in a desperate attempt, I went over to my collection of Luther sermons, and I don't think, at least in the collection I have, I did not see him preaching on any of these texts, so here's where we are. I am going to use this as a brainstorming session to see if I knock any stones loose in my brain. I'm talking through the text with you guys. And the one I'm choosing to do that with, because I think there's something there, I kind of want to preach on this text, is the Jonah text. We have a reading out of Jonah, um, specifically Jonah chapter 3, um, talking about the proclamation of Jonah and the repentance it produces in the Ninevites. Um, and I think maybe part of the reason I'm struggling with this one is I know what the lectionary is really, really pushing. Um, the gospel text is the uh, fishers of men, right? the call of um, Simon and his brother, um, Simon and Andrew, James and John. Come, I will make you fishers of men. They immediately leave their and I think that's why jo the Jonah text is there. I even think that the epistle reading, I think this is one of those Sundays where the epistle reading matches. And so because I know really what this text is, or what the lectionary authors, compilers, were wanting this Sunday to be, um, I'm struggling to go away from that. I 
kind of wanted to part a little bit because the other pastor I work with essentially did the same um, same sort of discipleship text um, last Sunday. And I kind of don't want to do the same thing two, two Sundays in a row. I could. Um, but quite frankly, he's a lot better at the discipleship sermons than I am. And uh, so if I'm going to repeat, I don't want to go backwards. <laughs> right? He, he did a good job. And so... We'll leave it at that. So I, I think I think I'm gonna preach on Jonah. You'll know what I've preached on by the time you watch this. So that'll be interesting for you, I'm sure. But I think I want to do Jonah. I want to kind of think through some things with him. So the text is on specifically that chapter three section. Although I think I want to expand in both directions. I've actually had some thoughts just before doing this, because I just filmed our, uh, our Sunday school lesson, which was essentially me just retelling the story of Jonah, and a few things triggered, so we'll talk through some of those. But what I want to do to kind of start this out, I'm saying start it out and we're 11 minutes in, this might be a long video, it just means I don't know what I'm talking about. But what I want to do to start this is actually kind of hit that part of the book of Jonah that we skipped. It's four chapters long, it's not a long book, um... But there's a section in there that is always skipped over. Uh, I shouldn't say always, almost always. It's like 25% of the book that just gets glossed over. And I think it's a real massive shame that it gets left out because I think it's in some ways the heart and soul of the book. Um, it certainly is how Jesus, what Jesus thinks is the heart and soul of the book of Jonah. So let me read that. And this is chapter 2. It's Jonah's prayer. Um, you may or may not have known this, but when Jonah was, well, in the belly of the fish, he prayed to God. And we have his prayer written down. Um, and we'll talk about the, the whole fish thing uh, in a little bit, because I think there's I think there's an interesting detail that is potentially missed. Um, it might not be right. It may be reading into the text, but we'll, we'll get to that when we get to it. Let's talk about the, the prayer first. So let me read it. Um, before we get going. So this is the entirety of chapter 2 that we'll read here. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall look again upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the root of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O oh Lord my God. My life was fainting away. I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you in your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out on the dry. It's an amazing prayer. Um, I remember when I read through the book of Jonah in uh, late high school, early college, this is when I read through the whole Bible, um, that the weeds surrounding Jonah's head, that's always stuck with me. I don't know why that is what really stood out, but whenever I think of Jonah's prayer, I think of weeds surrounding his head. But did you catch how Jonah talks? Jonah speaks of him being in Sheol, um, which is the abode of the dead. It's a bigger topic than we have time for. Talks about how the waters and the, the land even has swallowed him up forever. Jonah speaks here as if he's dead. Um, I know. We'll talk about that. But Jonah speaks as if he is dead, that he has died in fish, uh, or 
died in the waters. And yet the Lord heard him. The Lord, who is his salvation, heard his cries for mercy, sending the fish, in this case, to swallow him up, to vomit him forth uh, three days later. I don't know if it says three days in the text. I actually haven't read through the whole book as I went here. In my head, it's three days later. but I don't know if that's a Christological connection or if that's actually there. Um, probably should have looked that up before I started this, but unpolished, right? That's <laughs> what I said this whole series is. Again, I'm thinking through it. If I did or have preached on this text, then, uh, and I mentioned that, it means I checked. Um, I, that is the kind of thing that I look for before <laughs> I preach a sermon on something, because that's an easy thing to check, and it's uh, really important to kind of get details like that. But either way, Jonah's in this fish and he's crying out for mercy. He speaks about the Lord will save him. I love that uh, that last section, so starting with verse 7. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you in your holy temple. Those who pray, who pay regard to vain idols forsake the hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. Jonah knows he's getting through. Jonah knows that he will be delivered and he'll be able to sacrifice to God once again. I will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. And then the, the triumph at the end of the prayer. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Which we see in the book of Jonah. Jonah is saved more than once, I would say, by God. Clearly here. The Ninevites are saved. They are Their salvation comes from from the Lord. And of course, if we start pushing this towards Christ, I mean, I, I, the salvation uh, of Christ comes from the Lord. Awesome, awesome prayer. Um, so let's talk about that. Uh, I, I made an offhand, two offhand reference. It's not that offhand. To Jonah dying. So one of the major complaints about the book of Jonah is or goes something along the lines of, how could a man survive in the belly of a fish, essentially for three days, but for any length of time, right? Even if even if he went into the fish alive, he would drown in there, and the acid would kill him, right? He'd suffocate. Uh, there's no way he'd be able to get from wherever he was to dry land in time. So, it, right, the complaint is that the book of Jonah is completely unbelievable because Jonah survived his encounter with the whale. I don't think he did. I think Jonah died. There, there's no reason to believe that he didn't. His prayer seems to say that he has died, right? It says that he's descended into Sheol, that the earth has swallowed him up. This is language you use when you are speaking of death. Yes, it can be used metaphorically. I mean, this is used in the Psalms in a uh, clearly metaphorical sense. But I'm very much not convinced that Jonah lived. Right? Uh, if we're willing to say that God performed a miracle in having Jonah swallowed up by the fish, miraculously preserved within the fish, and then spat out however long later, why is it a stretch for us? Why are we afraid to say that the miracle here is not that Jonah survived this whole ordeal, but that he was resurrected? Right? Resurrections are kind of in God's wheelhouse. He, uh, he's pretty good at resurrections. It's kind of his end game. Right? Resurrection, not only of Christ, but of each and every one of us. And sure, we get to see a few pictures where people are resurrected, uh, both in the Old and the New Testament. But everyone will be resurrected, believers and non believers alike. So we shouldn't be so afraid to say, yep, Jonah died. Uh, if we're going to really split hairs, I think he died in the belly of the fish, simply because um, the first verse here says, then Jonah prayed to the Lord. Uh, the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. So it, if I'm a betting man and my money is on it, my guess is that Jonah almost drowned, didn't quite, got into this fish, and as soon as he got in there, somehow he recognized this as his salvation from God. Don't know if I would have the presence of mind to do that. Um, recognized that this is his salvation from God, prayed this prayer, and died. 
Uh, <laughs> that's how I think this very likely went down. Now, there's a good reason I think that Jonah died, other than the fact that it is a, is a better and a more biblically consistent reason, uh, or connection throughout Scripture. Um, it's because Jesus says that he's Jonah, right? We've talked about typology here on this channel. And by the way, I think it's the cipher that unlocks the Old Testament. Um, if you know me at all, you know how much I absolutely love the Old Testament. Are you prepared for hyperbole? Here it comes, right? I've, I've often hyperbolically joked that I don't need the epistles. Throw them out. I just need the Old Testament and the Gospels, and I'm good. Um, you don't even need the Gospels, almost, right? Again, hyperbole warnings here. If I knew how to edit, I'd put like big flashing warning signs. Here. So just imagine that. Um, Jesus is just so prevalent in the Old Testament, right? We see, I think, and Jesus tends to think as well, that He's in this story, that the story of Jonah is not about some dude who, you know, was disobedient and got thrown over, eaten by a fish, and then reluctantly preached to uh, the Ninevites. But Jesus tends to think, um, he says so himself, the sign of Jonah, right, is him dying, being swallowed, not by a fish, but by the grave, right, seems to be reflective in Jonah's prayer. It's... Too far, but uh, it's almost as if you can imagine Jesus praying this prayer in the tomb. Obviously, he's not because he is dead in the tomb until he's resurrected. But who knows? Maybe this could be the first thing that Jesus said or thought after his resurrection. Right? Maybe before he, you know, blasted the stone away, scared the guards half to death, and just waltzed out. Maybe he stopped and prayed this prayer to God. Absolutely no way of knowing. It's possible. But think about it. Go back through. I'm not going to reread it because, like I said, I think this is already going to be a pretty long episode. Reread that prayer, and instead of it being Jonah in the belly of a fish, think of it as Jesus in the belly of the earth, in the tomb. That's, who, that's what Jesus says in Jonah. And so I think this kind of is pushing me towards where I think I might go slash have gone with um, the sermon. Where my brain went is, and perhaps this is a connection to next week's Old Testament reading, which is from Deuteronomy, um, where it talks about how God will send a greater Moses. What if we pair Jesus and Jonah? And compare them with uh, with one another. By the way, this is if you are curious as to how my sermon process or sermon writing process goes, this is pretty par for the course. In fact, I'm doing it currently. So, again, we'll see if I think this is a good direction to go, or you will already know. I have yet to see. So let's pair Jonah and Jesus, and really push this image of. Jesus is the greater Jonah. And I think the way I want to do it, we'll see. Because it brings in the text in particular. And it also pushes really both directions. Um, oh, before I forget, it just came to mind. Um, really neat connection also with Jonah, who is, again, I meant to read this before I started. Um, Jonah's sleeping in the, the ship as... The storm is about to smash it to pieces, and the sailors are terrified, and as soon as Jonah gets thrown over, it's completely calm. Sounds like a story about Jesus you've ever heard before. But I don't think I'm going to bring that into the sermon. Just between us, I wanted to uh, share that connection, just in case you hadn't seen it before. Or we could revel in it together if, you did, uh, if you've been shouting at the monitor for me to bring that up. But what if we push this out, both directions from that text in uh, Jonah chapter 3? Because we all know what happened before. This prayer, the death in the, in the whale or the fish or whatever. And we all know what, or I, if you don't know, go read it. But um, you can pause the video, read Jonah. It won't take you very long, and then come back. But after he preaches, Jonah is just waiting for God to smite the city, right? He's waiting for Sodom and Gomorrah to come. What if 
Jesus do? Right? So we, we say that, I say at least, that Jonah is a type of Christ. That he is emblematic of Christ. That he's a reflection, a shadow of Jesus. And I think that shadow, well, I know that shadow because Jesus says it does, extends to his time in the belly of the fish, his time in death, in the tomb, swallowed up by the grave, by the fish, Jesus. Followed up by the grave. But for the sake of rhetorical device, what if that's not all? Or what if that wasn't all that Jonah was a type of? What if God, what if Jesus reacted the same way that Jonah did? Initially, uh, not wanting to come, right? not wanting to go and to deliver. The word of God, which, interesting implications there. Um, we know that that's not the case. Right? Christ delighted to become man. Uh, otherwise, he wouldn't have, right? I was uh, talking with my high schoolers this Sunday, uh, talking about well, Abraham and Isaac. It's not a really great uh, typological thing. But if Jesus didn't want to do anything, it wouldn't have happened, right? He is God. Um, and as God, if Jesus didn't want to die, if Jesus didn't want to be born as a man, if Jesus didn't want to take his disciples, he wouldn't have. Right? Again, he's God. He doesn't have to do anything he's not willing to do. Um, now, we still see submission, right? And uh, in the garden, thy will be done, right? Even though he's asking for the cup to be taken from him. And yet he is a willing, he's willingly submitting himself, which makes it all the more amazing. What's more impressive, the person who is humbled or the person who humbles themselves? The person who is forced into service, such as Jonah, or the one who willingly goes to service, even though the situation is much worse? Um, the Ninevites were kind of awful people, especially to the, well, in particular, the northern tribes of Israel, which is who uh, Jonah was living among and who he was a prophet among. The Nineveh, Nineveh is the capital of Assyria. Um, and if you don't know, the Assyrians and the Israelites did not get along. The Assyrians were absolutely brutal. Uh, you might even say genocidal against the uh, Israelites, which is why Jonah doesn't want to go, right? Because he's kind of afraid this whole time that God will forgive them, and he doesn't want that to happen. We're worse uh, in our relationship with God. Could you imagine if Jesus reacted the same way as Jonah? If Jesus reacted, not with willing submission and willing service, but instead, no, I don't want them to be forgiven. Where would you be now? Or, after Jonah died, <laughs> was resurrected and preached God's forgiveness, right? Jonah goes to watch Sodom and Gomorrah 2.0, as I've said. What if Jesus did? Do you imagine instead of ascending into heaven uh, to plead before the Father upon our behalf to be the intercessor, uh, the one who comes in between the judgment seat and us, then instead of ascending into heaven, Jesus climbed the nearest mountain. Let's say Mount Everest, right? It's not the nearest mountain. I understand that, but you can see the most. And he just waited for God to annihilate the world. How it's shocking to think. So different is the love and the mission of Christ to the reluctance of Jonah. So shockingly different that this type of Christ and the fulfillment in our Savior who does not disdain the fact that he must come to save us poor, miserable wretches of sinners, but instead does so willingly, does so happily, joyfully even, not being forced into the tomb because he's disobedient like Jonah, but rather going to the tomb willingly, so that as Jonah's prayer concludes, salvation might belong to the Lord, so that salvation might belong to Christ. What if? So, I think this is where I'm going to end my musings 
ruminations, ramblings, if you will. Um, it'll be interesting. Like I said, you guys uh, have, will have the benefit of, if you're a member of my congregation, I think almost all members of my congregation. Although, I know a couple of my friends back home are, and so good to see you guys. I'm glad to see that you sat through 30 minutes of me talking about a sermon I may or may not preach. But you'll, you'll all get to see what I've done on Sunday. So it'll be interesting. Compare notes. What is the beginning of the sermon process to what it actually ends up with? Um, I don't think that I can just, you know, play this recording on the screen. I don't think that'll go over well for a couple of reasons, um, not least of which being the fact that it'll be projected onto a screen, and I would just be sitting there um, listening to myself preach which is a strange thing to do, um, but that's enough of that. And so all of you who wait on the Lord, raise a glass and let us drink to Christ's imminent.